with the, um, I think we can all agree that the ultimate goal of quality management principles and uh, goals in the world of healthcare are that we first um, keep our patients safe, uh, we uh, protect their rights uh, and integrity uh, of the patients in all clinical trials and also post-marketing activities and that we, in other words, can trust our data or uh, uh, say uh, data integrity of the data created in these clinical trials. So um, of course those are the two key goals. We could add other goals to it which I would agree we can. For example, we could add another goal which would be uh, rather a project management goal uh, about timelines and budget. So basically because in the environment today we're working in we always have quite uh, some uh, challenges um, and uh, timelines to meet. So therefore that would be also something but since risk-based monitoring is rather um, or in this uh, series of seminars here I would rather like to address the risk-based monitoring from the aspect from the aspect of um, the compliance and not so much the uh, the timeline and budget issue. Of course, budget could be an issue if uh, you're running out of budget and you do not have um, enough funding anymore in your clinical trial. Uh, that uh, basically the two aspects you see here will suffer. But um, I. Uh, hope that you understand that I will leave this aspect of project management, so uh, timeline adherence, budget adherence, etc., out for the moment. Um, the holistic approach to actually managing quality in clinical trials um, is something that needs to be put on a very, very sound basis. And as you can see here, those are the four pillars I'd like to take you through today. Um, and we will go into uh, further detail in the next sessions to come, next week for example. But for today I'd like to uh, speak about those uh, four foundations um, as an oversight and introduce each one of them to you, why they are important. Now starting of course first with the protocol, protocol development quality by design aspect. The protocol is the key element to a good clinical trial. As FDA <coughs> has always uh, lined out, uh, the protocol is the blueprint for the clinical trial. Uh, a good protocol uh, has a chance to make a good clinical trial. A bad protocol will never turn into a good clinical trial because uh, it actually does not provide the right prerequisites for a successful and uh, lean as I would call it, clinical trial, because that's what we're looking for, and focused uh, clinical trial. Now, this is also something that we have already talked about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, two days ago, um, and this is not something new to you. Um, however, the next uh, point is basically the so-called study feasibility aspect, or let's say, St study startups, uh, study s infrastructure. Um, I, I usually like to compare it with, you know, the protocol is the recipe, the cooking recipe if you want to make a dish, and the um, studies feasibility, the study, the, the trial infrastructure basically is all the tools you need from actually making that dish. You know, you need a kitchen, you need a stove, you need pots and pans, whatever. You know, if you want to bake a cake, you need a mixer, you need all, all the things that, the ingredients, etc. And the protocol is actually the instruction how to do it. You know, what to take first, what to do, how, what temperature to bake the cake, what, what about the icing, and so on and so forth. And that is actually um, the second part that we can see here. I'd like to uh, um, highlight this uh, briefly to you. So basically study feasibility is um, about the analysis of the study infrastructures as you can see here, um, implementation strategy and the conduct of feasibility performance assessment on 
vendors and processes. And I particularly emphasize and like to emphasize the vendor aspect here. Why am I doing that? It's because uh, in our clinical environment, um, third party service providers or vendors short are an integral part of nearly all studies that are being run. At the moment, um, only a very small percentage of trials are not using any service provider. And here I'm not talking about trials that are being run by big zeros. I'm talking about that we, uh, that we always use a service provider somewhere in our clinical, clinical, clinical study. And if it is only a contract employee, so not a permanent employee, but someone we have hired for that particular trial, maybe a monitor, you know, freelance monitor we've hired, this is a third party. This is not an employee of our company or of the sponsor we're actually working for. And all the other aspects. So study feasibility or the study infrastructure assessment, including all the service providers, is key. And I'm mentioning that here and I'm stressing the vendors because um, in the past years, and you can nicely look this up if you go to the FDA homepage and look up the BIMO report. So this is the uh, from, from the inspection office. Uh, the findings uh, pertaining to service providers and the lack of oversight of service providers is increasing over the past years. And especially the FDA, but also now the EMA is taking particular interest in reviewing that uh, aspect of clinical trials. So the involvement of third parties in your clinical study and the oversight that you exercise as a sponsor because yes, you can outsource tasks, but you cannot outsource your responsibility for the clinical study. So if something happens, it's you, everybody will come to, not your vendors. Now this is the second piece, very important because you have to know about it. You need to know about the risk that this imposes on you. Same as for the protocol, you know, depending on how complex your protocol are and what aspects are described in there, you know there's a risk. Coming back to making a cake or a dish, you know, if you want to make a very complicated dish where, you know, it's a very complex, you know, you have to do, get the timing right, you know, also you don't want to make a, a nice, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Philly Wellington uh, perhaps. Uh, so. It needs to be the right time in the oven, it needs to have a nice crust and blah, blah, blah. So all those kind of things you need to think about. So it's quite a complex dish, you know, compared to making a fried egg, which is not really so complex. And in the same way, we also have clinical studies that are more complex than others. And of course, complex protocols already have an inherent risk, whereas then once they're set into their um, infrastructure environment in which they actually should work, that also contributes to the risks. You can have, for example, service providers uh, that um, through uh, their capability or their experience or how they work uh, imposing a risk on the trial or not, or um, depending on what kind of drug you're actually testing. Is a cold chain product? Is something that will be administered at home? Um, think about the documentation, additional uh, regulatory requirements in those countries where you're conducting the study, etc., etc. All those aspects will be looked at in the second part. But that's not all yet. There's also another one that's called site, site enrollment optimization and the site assessment is actually behind that. Because <clears throat> sites are, of course, we're always willing to do a good job. And I think I mentioned last time, if I didn't, I, I'm, I'm saying it again, forgive me if I repeat myself. But we have a situation currently that in clinical studies, the, um, the turnover of, of investigators is quite high. Um, what is the reason? The reason is that uh, studies are quite complex and that sponsors of clinical trials are trying to save more and more money uh, in actually not uh, giving, you know, the sufficient support to sites. I have a, a friend who is um, a specialist in uh, diabetes, a diabetologist, and he used to participate in clinical studies. He is not anymore, so he's actually very experienced. He runs one of the largest practices in Germany on diabetes. And <clears throat> he told me why he's not doing that anymore, because uh, he has to 
the effort that costs him to actually be compliant, to follow all the protocols correctly, and to be compliant with GCP, ICH, ICH GCP, GCP is um, very expensive. And he said he's actually making a negative on uh, what they, he gets for the, each patient and for the trials. So he's not doing that anymore. And his staff is not, uh, you know, actually, uh, they're not, uh, they didn't go on a strike, but <laughs> they, they basically uh, had a discussion into uh, one and decided not to, not to uh, further pursue this. So, um, uh, what am I saying with this? Basically, what I'm saying is that many, many sites are frustrated, especially the ones that are newcomers to clinical trials, and especially, you know, having the topic diabetes, there you have a lot of GPs or general practitioners uh, participating in clinical studies because in diabetes you don't have specialized hospitals like you have in oncology. When you are, uh, suffer from cancer, you, you will get to a special clinic with diabetes. Not necessarily. The, the special diabetes clinics are very rare and usually you're treated by your, your GP. So, here you have a practice with a doctor, with a nurse, maybe another nurse, etc., and they now need to comply with ICH GCP. It's very complex and not um, very pleasant for some, and that's why currently the turnover, approximately, and that's a, that's a figure I got from Kristen Pierre, she's the president of a site organization in the U.S., is 40% in that organization. So basically the members of that organization, 40% turnover. So 40% of the sites have participated in a clinical study are not willing to participate in the next trial because of the, ex the experience they have uh, collected in that, uh, in that study. So um, why am I bringing this up? This is very important because um, we know on one hand that if sites are not experienced, they need a lot of support. And that's uh, very well connected with risk-based monitoring because monitoring, especially risk-based monitoring, is supposed to focus on those sites and uh, those who actually need support, the coaching, the, the support, the, um, the hand-holding, if you may uh, want to call it that. So basically, the information, in addition to um, <clears throat> what they have understood, uh, the protocol tells them. That's one part. The other part is that um, with an assessment like this, so doing a site feasibility and design execution of enrollment campaigns, basically you can today through predictive modeling and access to electronic health records actually plus, sorry I forgot, plus the uh, right stringency in defining um, exclusion and inclusion criteria, you can through this actually um, forecast the enrollment uh, of patients at certain sites, including the accessibility of the site, etc. Because in some countries you do have patients who have to travel quite far to get to a clinic or a, a practice uh, to a doctor. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you take African countries, they, they sometimes travel a day or two to get to it. Uh, hardly imagine sometimes because, you know, usually the doctor's practice is more or less around the corner in, in Western countries. But that's not always the case. So here um, we need to see, okay, how many patients can this site actually enroll because to how many patients would they have access? And access means are the patients actually willing to come to the site? Do they have the possibility to come to the site? Is there public transport? Uh, do they have a car? Is, is there an airport closed? Etc. So there's many aspects we need to consider and look into before we can actually uh, start enrolling. And with this predictive, uh, predictive model, you are in a position to uh, better define uh, the sites for the trial and better select them. And later, you're not suffering from uh, too few patients at the site, and you know that those sites. Uh, have actually uh, be able to uh, fulfill the requirements of the protocol and are motivated to do that. And last but not least, um, I think I have some, oh no, sorry, um, I hope you still see the four columns. Um, and last but not least, just to pick the pen again,
now come in, and this, uh, I'm sorry, I did not mark that. All of this, what we have here, basically is done in the planning phase. So all protocol, quality by design, study feasibility, infrastructural uh, risk assessment, site involvement optimization, and site assessment are done during the planning phase. So this is a very important aspect. So you can see that most of the effort that should, uh, you know, that, that build a part, <clears throat> a part of the foundation for risk-based monitoring is done and should be done during the planning phase. And last but not least, which is then done in the conduct phase, is the measurement reporting quality improvement. So basically, implementation of analytical, statistical, and financial models to uncover interoperable deviations and measure quality compliance and business productivity. So here we talk about the metrics, so risk indicators, performance indicators, anything that falls under this category. And that is done while the trial is running because we want to have a look. <clears throat>